So it seems like conventional wisdom is just everywhere right now. Um, I, you know, I like to watch all the financial shows. It's painstaking, but I do it. And it just seems like every quote unquote expert right now uh, has the same spiel. It's like, well, stocks used to be a great place to be, but now they have competition because I can get 5% in a money market fund or a one year treasury. And as you and I, you guys know, and I know is whenever the conventional wisdom, everyone believes the same thing, it's probably not the right thing to do. Well, let's face it, guys. You know, I've been through this a little longer. I've gone through a few more cycles than, than the average bear or bull for that reason. Um, but, you know, whenever you get to a point in the investment world where there's a democratization of investing, where it becomes easy, right? All I need to do is own the Magnificent Seven and a three-month T-bill, and I'm set for life. You know, I don't, I'm not listening to anybody else anymore. That's my investment strategy. Well, you know, that's not the right strategy. You know, I was talking to a client of mine the other day, and he told me that during the summertime, his favorite pastime is to sit in his backyard, which overlooks the bay, and watch boats go over this one spot uh, where the water's really shallow and watch the boats run aground. It's a great spot because that's the easiest way to get to the ocean. But the reality is, is most people don't know it's shallow there. So everybody makes the same pitfall when they don't know what they're doing. That's actually... I'll give you credit because your selling analogies are always uh, not my favorite. <laughs> only, jo only joking, Chris. I love your selling analogies. But, you know, it's a really good point because, like, if you're sitting in that bay when the water's up, but you know the tide's going to go out at some point, uh, but you kind of ignore it uh, because right now you feel good, I think that – and then all of a sudden, right, the tide goes out and all of a sudden you're sitting in the sand. Um, I think that's what's happening right now with sitting in short-term cash positions because – Everything the Fed is signaling says the Fed's probably going to cut interest rates next year, which almost assures you that that 5% that you're getting sitting in cash is going to be lower next year. <laughs> so, you know, meanwhile, everyone's saying this is a great place to hide out. But like, when do you get out of cash if you know that rates are going to probably go down sooner than later? And meantime, as we know, the market's on sale. We've got a lot of uncertainty right now, which is your friend when you're an investor. And we've talked about this a lot. And we have a 16-year high in interest rates like, why wouldn't you start locking into longer term bonds? It's just like, you're right. People are so short sighted when it comes to investing and they don't think about what's going to happen in just 12 months. And we know things are going to change drastically in 12 months. You know, I think what Chris was saying and what I always say is that, you know, it's not that the markets that change, right? Markets are always volatile. You know, what stays the same is investors, right? They make the same mistakes over and over again. Let's just take where we are right now. We, we had a really, really good market going this year. Um, and then in July, actually the end of July, you know, we hit a short term peak and we're in a corrective mode, right? We're having a 10%. Anytime the market goes down more than 10%, it's correction as opposed to a pullback, right? You know, if you, get, you, have, to, you have to put a, a label on it. Um, but we've been here before. But I guarantee you, every single investor is saying the same thing. Yeah, it's 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 a correction, but it's different this time. You don't understand, yeah. right? Things are really bad this time. The other times they weren't that bad, right? The other time when Greek was, you know, when Greece was defaulting on its debt, or when they downgraded the uh, U.S. Treasury to a double A, those things weren't that bad. Now's really bad. Yeah, I mean, the world's always in flux. It's always uncertain, but we always feel like the current present moment is more uncertain than anything in the past, and it's never true, right? It's just our human ability to, to see things differently or reflect on the past differently because uh, we can't really rely on our memories because, you know, they're, they're skewed and they're biased. Uh, but meantime, right, if you look at just moving ahead, uh, you, you have a point right now where you, know, you do have markets sold off, which AKA is always the best time to buy. You have multiples that are relatively cheap and earnings over the next two years are going to go up 26%. And we know that stocks are beholden to what earnings do, right? So you almost have the perfect backdrop here to buy stocks. Meanwhile, we talked about this before. The fundamentals are the same. Strong labor market, inflation coming down, uh, which speaks to you know, almost a no landing over the next 12 months. Meanwhile, you know, emotionally, everyone feels terrible and everyone's scared and they want to just sit in cash. Well, wait a second, right? I've got a great memory. I remember when the market pulled back in 2008 and things got better. I remember when the market pulled back during a global health crisis in 2020 and then things got better. I don't know. I remember all those times pretty clearly. Well, here's that's the best part of it, right? I mean, we had, remember when COVID hit, we had that 35% correction and, you know, everybody was panicking. Everybody's hair was on fire, obviously. I mean, it's a scary drop. 
but they can't see any way things could get better. But here's the thing. Things didn't just get worse, right? The only thing that happened over the last three months is we had a correction. The fundamentals didn't change, right? The earnings are actually coming in as uh, unexpected. They're coming in stronger than expected. GDP number uh, was 4.9%. Now, GDP now was saying it was going to be 5.4%, but that's, you know, they, they don't really uh, predict right to the decimal point, let's face it. But the fact of the matter is the, the news and the earnings and the financial and the economic numbers have been a lot better, but people's thinking only goes through the lens of volatility. Markets down, things yeah. must be bad. Markets up, things must be good. Yeah, the other thing too is I was talking to a client of mine the other day. Uh, he's a retired uh, podiatrist and, um, you know, we were talking about the markets and he was saying the same thing. How could things get better? And I said, well, you ran a podiatry practice in 2008. He said, yeah. I said, were things bad then? He said, yes. I said, did you stop seeing patients? He said, no. He said, you know, we, we kept seeing patients. I'm like, why? He said, because we still needed to make money. And I said, well, guess what? Every business owner around the world was doing the same <laughs> thing and they're still doing that now. Yeah. Yeah. We're all trying to better our situation. And I, I kind of get it right now because if you look at the S&P 500, I mean, it's in the same place now for two and a half years. We're back to where we were really in the spring of 2021. So that's frustrating. But, you know, we talk about this a lot and people don't realize this. And I think this is where the big mistake becomes or investors make rather is markets tend to do nothing for a long time. And then, bam, they melt up. Uh, then they do nothing for a long time. Maybe they come down a little bit. They go up a little bit. Bam, then they go much higher. And this is where a lot of these strategies don't work, like waiting in cash, waiting for the right moment, because once the market moves, you've missed it. Or these covered call strategies it drives me nuts, where people think, well, I'll just write covered calls in my portfolio, get that extra income while the market goes sideways. But then, bam, markets go up huge. You get limited on your upside, and you never want to miss the upside in the market. That should be like rule number one. And that's what investors kind of forget is like you can't miss those big days up, and no one knows when they're going to actually be. Wait a minute, guys. Let's just face it. No one in the world can time or trade these emotionally short-term swings. They're emotionally driven short-term swings in a market, right? It's completely emotional. Um, and when do, when do you want to take action, right? Not before it drops 10%, but after. And it's always a mistake. Um, the, the key is to have a strategy that keeps you invested because exactly what you said, right? These, these, these returns, they come in spurts and they come in big chunks and you can't predict when they're going to happen. Um, and, and if you invest your money emotionally, you're going to fail, right? And when it comes to the market, right? Stocks and bonds, they're unemotional. Right? They're absolutely unemotional, dispassionate, um, and the market's already looking past the problems that we're discussing, you know, ad nauseum on CNBC and Fox Business right now. Well, you know what? I think so much of life is, is what you focus on. You know, if you focus on miserable things, you're going to be miserable. You focus on good things, you're going to be happy. And it's kind of like I was talking to a client of mine and they've been focused on, you know, the overall value of the portfolio. I said, well, let's focus on what you're getting in income. You know, we bought in bonds with better yields. Um, it, it, dividends are going up. I said, you're making more income than you did last year. I said, well, let's focus on that. <laughs> well, that's also a great point is what people forget um, is stocks are increasing cash flow investments. You know, those dividends increase over time. So meanwhile, you've got a lot of risk that your money market fund is going to go down in the next year, whereas dividend yields have been rising consecutively almost every year, you know, during our lifetime. There's only a couple years in the past where our dividends didn't go up. So you know, maybe you're only getting 2 3% in dividends today. Well, that could be 6 7% in 10 years just because they incrementally increase over time. And that's really critical. You've got to play the long game when it comes to investing. You can't be as short-sighted as this is what I can get today and this feels good today. That's like the antithesis of a good investment strategy. Well, you know, uh, a little stat that we saw the other day was uh, interest income, you know, and personal income is at a record $1.8 trillion right now. So you're wondering, you know, how come people are out there spending, right? It's up $300 billion from two years ago. So interest rates go up on cash. You know, it's paying more interest. Rents have risen over the last 10 years. People are earning more rent uh, on their income. See, the baby boomers, you know, my generation, greatest generation ever, according ah. to, to me, um, you know, we control half of the country's net worth, right? $75 trillion. Now, we're not sitting home making dinner for each other every night. We're going out to dinner every night, right? We're, we're using services. Um, our health is good. 
but deteriorating. So we're using the medical system more. So, we're, you know, we're going out to see more doctors and we're taking advantage of that. So people are wondering, like, where's all this money coming from? Well, with higher interest rates, higher rent incomes, you know, people with assets uh, are, are having more disposable income. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we had a big jump in retail sales last week. I'd like to take this time to personally thank you, Dad, for going out to dinner every night so Ryan and I can have a better life. <laughs> I'm not talking about it's my friends that go out to dinner every night. I have to, you know, I have to tell them that I'm, you know, I'm not feeling well. I have to stay home every once in a while. It's a, it's a tough burden on Bob, for sure, to, to have to go out, play golf, go to dinner with all his friends. I know it's, oof, here's the smallest violin in the world, Bob. I know it's hard. But he can sum it up in, in, I think, one sentence here is the death of the consumer has been greatly exaggerated. I mean, that was the big concern last year. The consumer was going to fall off a cliff. That's the same concern now. And I think the one thing we can bet on here as the sun rises in the east is Americans will find a way to spend that'll continue to uh, produce positive GDP growth going into next year and into the future. It's time to be optimistic. It's time to be bullish. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 138, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you want to figure out where you are with regards to financial independence, retirement, and you've saved over a million dollars, Chris, Bob, and I will run for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. If you need an income plan for retirement, we show you how to optimize, take Social Security the right way for you, and the best way to take from your portfolio, factoring in taxes and inflation so you don't run out of money building a full dynamic income plan. We're going to look at diversification. Markets have been extremely volatile over the last two years. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo or have you been sitting in cash paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out your long-term game plan? We'll put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products like structured products, annuities, insurance products, brokerage products, mutual funds. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. So if you qualify and you've saved over a million dollars for your financial independence, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, you know, literally we run hundreds upon hundreds of financial plans a year for our clients, all our financial advisors at our firm. That's like what we really focus on more than anything else. And a lot of times what we find is you've done a great job of saving your money, but maybe not the best job of making decisions about that money once it's saved uh, to make sure that you're really optimizing for financial independence or retirement. You know, today's Halloween. I want to put a little Halloween spin on today as we record this. And uh, the first one I'll take is too much in cash. Is that a trick or a treat? <laughs> I'm going to say that's a trick because you know what? You're getting like 5% in your money market right now. Things are good. But what happens when interest rates go down? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the theme of the show today, right? Like rates are probably going down next year. You can't just sit here and hope for the best. And you're going to figure out that magical time to move your money out of cash into other investments. I wish I had that crystal ball but I don't. That's disappointing. Well, hey, guys, how could $6 trillion be wrong, right? There's $6 trillion in the money market fund. I mean, I think they have it all figured out. Why would I take any risk with you guys in the market when I can get uh, 5% sitting in a treasury money market fund right now? Well, the other side of the coin is, and this is where financial planning is kind of an art and science, is you can have too much risk too, right? You can be too conservative or you can have too much risk mm -hmm. or too much of your money is overweighted in like large cap, mega cap stocks, which feels so good when they're going up. But remember last year when they got hammered and the NASDAQ was down like 30% and you saw that extreme volatility and there's no reason you can't have that again. So, you know, the one thing we found is with all the financial plans we run is most of you take more risk than you need to achieve your goals. And my philosophy is like, why take more risk than you have to? Why make your life more miserable than it has to be? Find that right amount of risk. So you can sleep at night and you're not worrying about like every economic data, piece of economic data has to come out every day. 
Well, you know, it's one thing I learned, guys, from from helping people with their financial plans over almost 50 years is that everybody's perspective of risk is different. You know, it, it's almost the factor of when you were born and what your life experience has been. You know, what we see as risk is totally different than someone else. Like, for example, my my mom and dad saw people in the depression. You know, they, they their life experience was they saw people on the on the corner literally selling apples to try and feed their their families. So, you know, they 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 witnessed the depressed the Great Depression, and it has a a mental impact on how you perceive risk and how you invest. And that's where I think planning is so critical because it breaks it down to apples and oranges, and, and it's in black and white, and you can see the implications of you don't do certain things as opposed to, you know, relying on that emotional response and relying on the way your brain's wired at an early age. So it's, um, you know, it's not simple. There are no rules of thumb. And that's why everybody should have a customized individual plan. No, it's a great point because investing, financial planning, it's so emotional, right? And at the end of the day, you need, like, we are horrible investors. <laughs> Human behavior is not conducive for making good decisions when it comes to your money. And you know, that's why we call investing more of a discipline than anything else, because it really is a discipline as opposed to, well, I just have a feeling about this. That's my favorite line. <laughs> yes. When I hear a client say, I just have a feeling that you know this is going to happen in the economy, or I just have a feeling that bad things are going to happen. Never rely on your gut. It's not reliable, and it usually is telling you to do the wrong thing. <laughs> like It's unbelievable how, uh, how badly... Uh, if we were left to our own devices, we are as investors. Or this one, my friend who reads Money Magazine said this is a good pick. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's like the cocktail party. Uh, I got this tip. I, you know, my my friends are all doing this, and it's like if you're, yeah. What was that one? Was it the Durham? There was one of one, one of those Middle Eastern currencies at one point that everyone. Oh yeah, it, it, oh, the dinar, the dinar, the dinar, right? the dinar. Yeah. That's right. Worthless pieces of paper were going to suddenly become worth a lot of money, and it's like. Yeah, it's like a mania. I mean, like there's a whole section of Northern Florida where we have an office where people, supposedly intelligent people, were buying into this scam. And they said, oh, you won't be laughing when I'm, when I'm a millionaire. And I said, well, you know, my, my bathroom does need to be wallpapered. So let me know when this deal is over. Uh, I can use some of that dinar for wallpaper. <laughs> but, you know, I, it's like anything else. Everything, there's a, there's a Goldilocks scenario for every single investor, right? You just, you don't need to be, uh, too hot or too cold. It needs to be just right. And it's it's really that simple. And, you know, when we're talking about risk, we're talking about volatility and volatility is inherent in all markets. And it's it's really reducing your portfolio to the volatility risk, you know, to the sleeping point. And, you know, it, it, and it allows you to get there. So what you need as an investor is to be patient. You know, you got to really Get rid of your green eyes. Don't be jealous of somebody who's making a killing in crypto, like one of your clients, Chris. Um, you know, he was couldn't believe that somebody he worked with made a million dollars in crypto and retired. I wonder whatever happened to that guy. That guy is actually back to work. He's back to work. Yeah. Okay, so, no kidding. Yeah, the grass <laughs> yeah. isn't greener. There are no there are no new errors. There are no special deals. And by the way, guys, I had I haven't had one question about artificial intelligence and how to capitalize on that. You know, since this correction started. How about you? <laughs> oh man. That's uh, that's a relief because if I have to hear about AI one more time, <laughs> you know, it's um, it, it's it's unbelievable. Like the, just whatever that hot trend is, and it just gets repeated over and over again, and that's forgotten so quickly as well. Uh, right. No one's talking about blockchain anymore, that's for sure. And not to say it won't be around, but it's like um, when something's hot, it's hot. When it's not, it's not. And I think the other mistake that investors make when they're saving is we put so much money in retirement plans that they become what we call ticking tax time bombs. You know, the only two things that are guaranteed in life, as we say, are, are death and taxes. And Byron Wien just, you know, de demonstrated to us once again, you know, death's inevitable. But, you know, you don't have to pay as much tax as you, as you, as, you know, the government wants you to. So you can have a tax efficient portfolio. You know, you, you have to make, you know, uh, lemonade out of lemons. You know, the markets are down in some of your portfolios. You know, do some tax swaps, take some losses. Because you know what? You're going to have gains, right? The new highs are inevitable in all markets, and you're ultimately going to have to pay capital gains tax. Um, so, you know, why pay all, all the tax that the government wants you to pay? You know, you'd be, you have to be hands-on and be tax efficient in your strategies. Yeah, and this is where right now, too, like Roth conversions, right? If you have all this money you're going to have to take out in your early to mid-70s, 
uh, that's going to cause a huge tax burden. Well, a year like this year where markets are down, maybe you're in a low income bracket this year, you can convert some of these lower price shares right now into a tax free Roth IRA, pay the tax now, um, and then all that money is tax free later. So there's lots of little tweaks. And I would just like the caveat is talk to your accountant as well. We always talk about having that financial dream team. You want your financial advisor, your accountant, uh, your estate planner all working together. But it's always, it's not like, right, it's not like making a killing on the Durham or crypto. It's like smart decisions, like incrementally doing a Roth conversion each year on your money that have yeah. the biggest impact uh, on your financial life long term. It's not sexy, it's boring, and they're little tweaks, but the compounding aspect of those little tweaks are huge. And that's what you really need to be focusing on. I couldn't agree more, right? So I spoke to a, a good friend of mine, a client, and and it, uh, th this volatility will you know upset even the most sane people. And he said, you know, I'm really worried about all the RMDs I'm going to have to take. You know, now that I'm in my 70s, I said, what are you talking about? He said, 80 percent of your your retirement accounts now in a Roth. We've been doing that for you know since they initiated Roth. He goes, really? He goes, I don't have to do an RMD from the Roth. I said, no. He said, so what am I worried about? I have no idea. You know, go fishing. You know, leave me alone. Have, go hang out with the grandkids. But, you know, yeah. it's it sometimes it, you're, you're absolutely right. So it's incremental things you do every single year. And and you need to do that because, you know, Washington, D.C., they're crack addicts when it comes to your tax dollars. And they're sitting there scheming and scamming away right now trying to figure out how can I get more of your hard earned money? So, you know, you need to pay attention to the tax laws and you need to take advantage of them. Well, you made a good point there about your, your dad, your client of being so worried about taking RMDs and just being so worried about his money in general. But, you know, th the one thing I like to remind my clients is that it's OK to live a little. You know, yeah. you worked hard your whole life. You know, you saved this money. I was talking to a client of mine the other day. They took a great trip to Singapore. And uh, I said, are you going to fly coach for first class? And he said, well, you know, it's first class is expensive. I said, well, look, you can't take it with you. I said, it's a long flight. It's the longest flight in the world. I'm like, treat yourself a little bit. You can afford it. Enjoy it. That's nice, Chris. So you actually engage your clients where Bob just tells them to go fishing because he doesn't want to bother. So <laughs> well, I, think, I think your service model is better. I think I know who I'd work with. I love it when my, my clients who do a great job of, of working hard their whole lives, plan, you know, following the plan, you know, having a lifetime of income they can't outlive. And then as you get older, you know, just naturally you get more concerned and you become more insecure. Um, and I just say, hey, look, you got to enjoy yourself. And, and, and if they won't, Chris, if they won't buy the first class ticket, they won't, you know, go on the vacation that I asked them to go on. I ask them, what color Lamborghini would you like me to pick out for your grandson? Um, <laughs> you know, because I tell you what, I, I guarantee it. If you don't spend it, your children and grandchildren will. And, and you know, and that's a perfect segue to me telling you guys, everything's going to my grandson. So you might as well forget <laughs> about your Lamborghini. Well, I look forward to Liam taking care of us when we're in the old folks home. <laughs> All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, the Nikkei Asia reported, which I think I'm saying that correctly, by 2035, an estimated 400 million people in China will be age 60 and over, representing 30% of the population, according to the government's own projections. That's an old population, man. Wow. Well, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but the largest nursing home in the world is China. Right. They made a huge mistake um, years ago. The government said you can only have one child and now they have a population problem. So, you know, I, I don't know. I've always distrusted governments, especially, uh, you know, communist governments. Uh, just one more example of uh, yeah. why you got to fear the government. You know, Chris, Bob is true. Bob is truly a child of the 60s. Don't trust the man. Don't trust anyone over 30. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, baby. <laughs> the real ethos of, uh, of uh, Bob had long hair. We know he was a hippie. <laughs> You listen to Led Zeppelin. <laughs> the, the summer of 69 was a wild summer for dad. Hey, you could get a date if you didn't have long hair. Trust me. <laughs> he had a long hair and a bandana. We know he had a bandana too. Never, never a bandana. Never a bandana. <laughs> <laughs> you saw Led Zeppelin at the Spectrum. Always. Um, all right, Chris. Really speaking of music, maybe not as good as Led Zeppelin, but Taylor Swift's Eras Tour has generated as much money as the economies of small countries. And one of the biggest years of her nearly two-decade career, she's entered even more rarefied status. She's a billionaire now, over $1 billion, I think $1.1 billion. The singer's 53 U.S. concerts this year added $4.3 billion to the country's gross domestic product, according to estimates from Bloomberg, Bloomberg Economics. 
Wow. I take back my earlier comment about the baby boomer supporting our economy. It's actually Taylor Swift. <laughs> well, what's amazing about her is she literally goes over demographic of women in their like as young as 10 years old, in their teen years, 20s, 30s, and our sister who's in our 40s. It's just incredible how many, how many age groups she appeals to. It's, it's a wild thing. Uh, no, she's a genius. She's a marketing genius. She's an uh, incredible talent. And um, a good friend of mine had to take his granddaughters to a concert. He said the, the, best, the best part about the concert was there was no line in the men's room and there was nobody <laughs> at the beer concession. So he said it, it actually did enjoy it. Yeah, I don't care what anybody says. But country still is not my favorite music. So. No, she's not country, buddy. <laughs> Call what you want, Bob. Sounds country to me. It's no Black Sabbath, but <laughs> I know. Well, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not a 14 year old girl either, and uh, you're not, you're, you're not, a, you're not your sister who's 38 who still loves, uh, loves Taylor Swift. Hey, Dad, you know what they say that you shouldn't talk religion or politics in polite company. While when talking to Ryan, I would add music to that. No, this is true. It's, it's not my fault that true. my music opinion is better than yours, and that's a great place to end this podcast. Well, hey, I hope you enjoyed episode 138, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love our podcast. Please give us that five-star ratings on iTunes. Leave a comment there. Let other people know how great our podcast is. This is on Spotify. You can subscribe. And if you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can like this episode. You can subscribe to our channel. Click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. Your support gives us the ability to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind. <laughs>